Good morning, Houston, FloridaLA.net, and I'm Kemp Parr. This morning, my guest is Robert Dietz, the chief economist with the NHB, the National Association of Home Builders. Rob, how you doing? I'm doing well. Good to join you. It's good to talk to you. It's been a little while since we've talked. I wanted to catch up with where the housing market was now and what your outlook was for the rest of the year. It's actually a pretty good picture, or at least it was in January. It kind of peaked, didn't it? If you look at the month-by-month numbers, definitely the, the surge, the, the rebound in home construction that we saw that really benefited single-family home building and remodeling, that reached a, a high level, at least in terms of builder sentiment, last November. Okay. Uh, we used the NHB Wells Fargo Housing Market Index as a way of tracking the outlook for market conditions. It's a 0 to 100 scale, and it was 90 in November. It has since trended lower to a level of 82, but it's worth keeping in mind any score above 50 indicates positive market conditions. But generally what we've seen since last November is the combination of an acceptance that interest rates are going to be higher, means demand-side considerations, and of course higher lumber costs, other kinds of building materials, uh, delays in appliances means that construction is going to take longer, and be more expensive on the supply side. And so on net, uh, you know, I think we're expecting for single-family construction gains this year, but at growth rates that are lower than what we saw in 2020. Yeah, because I've, I've been watching the last couple of months, we've seen just a little bit of a slowdown, and I guess that's being blamed, even in some of your all's press releases, it costs a little bit more with shortage of supply materials like lumber, or I think somebody said there, it costs $24,000 more to build a house the lumber costs now than it was maybe last year. Is that right? That is right. In fact, if you look at the structural lumber prices, which hit a low in um, April of 2020, since that time, lumber prices are up 200%. Yeah. And, yeah, one of the numbers my team pr- uh, produced uh, just a few weeks ago, that is adding for a typical home, and a, a typical newly built home is about you know, 24, 2,600 square feet. Um, that's adding about $24,000 uh, to the price of that home. Yeah. So, you know, these are not small numbers, and I think the challenge in 2021 is despite the fact that the demographics are, are favoring single-family housing demand, particularly mm-hmm. the millennials beginning to move into their, their 40s, yeah. uh, we know that people need more space, and there was a, a preference shift toward single-family housing. Yeah. And we've got really, really low levels of existing home inventory, less than a, a two-month supply. That The demand side is generally positive, but some of the housing affordability conditions are going to get tighter this year. And it's going to be a challenge for builders to try to navigate uh, some of those crosswinds in terms of the housing outlook. Well, we're forming households at about a $1.5 million rate per year. So if you combine both single and multifamily new construction, are we at about 1.5 or 1.6 million units? What are we looking at? I think we're probably looking closer to about 1.2 million net household formations occurring a year. And what that would suggest is that we probably need to be building about 1.2 million Uh single family homes. And that includes both uh, for household formations, second homes and replacement of older housing. And then something between three and four hundred thousand, probably closer to four hundred thousand on the multifamily side. And so our expectation this year is we're gonna to continue to underbuild and we've been doing that of course for most of the post Great Recession period. But this year we expect a, you know, kind of a single digit percent gain for single family construction over what was a very strong twenty twenty. And in twenty twenty we got real close to a million single family starts. Okay. So this year we're expecting somewhat under 1.1 million on on the single family side, and we think multifamily is going to continue to weaken and then later later stabilize in the second half of the year, and that should put multifamily uh, construction starts uh, somewhere around 370 thousand units. So all in all, it, it's going to be a, a year of growth in residential construction, but those growth rates are going to be smaller than what we saw in 2020 particularly on the single-family side, where 2020 we ended the year up 12% on single-family uh, housing starts. And we had started the year expecting only about a 3 to 4% gain. Mm-hmm. Of course, that was well before uh, COVID began to affect the economy. Right. 
So one of the things I know that NAHB says in their press releases is that, yeah, people are moving into suburbs. They're looking for larger homes. So that's another factor, right? It absolutely is. And to me, that was one of the biggest stories on housing demand in 2020. Mm-hmm. It's a little controversial among economists. Economists love to debate each other, of course. Uh, but uh, we, we definitely saw in the construction data what we call the suburban shift. Mm-hmm. The markets where single-family home building was growing the fastest tended to be lower density, lower cost, lower regulatory burden type markets. Mm-hmm. So you had growth picking up. Uh, in a fairly rapid fashion in you know, markets that in previous years have been relatively flat, including markets in the Midwest. And, of course, you always have the, the high growth areas in the southeast yeah. and some of the mountain states. Uh, we think that uh, telecommuting, for example, uh, is going to enable people, even within metropolitan areas, to live a little further out. Because if you're working under a 3 2 model where you – you work in the office or at the, the, your workplace three days a week and work at home two days a week and, of course, a, a two-day weekend. Well, you're only going to be doing that, that daily commute three days a week, and uh, you can drive further to qualify, particularly if you want a larger lot or a larger house. Uh-huh. Not everyone's going to be in that position. In fact, our estimates suggest that it's probably only going to be about 30 or 40 percent of workers who will be able to take advantage of that telecommuting. But even if that 30 or 40 percent aren't traveling as much, uh, the roads should be less congested, and that too will enable others to live a little further out. And all of that's good news for new construction. A second ago, you brought up this regional data, and I'm glad you did, because you take a national average and you get one number, but you start looking deeper and you see the west is in a decline. The northeast is not as hot as we're seeing in the Midwest and the south, right? That's correct. Even within those uh, census regions, there's a fair amount of variation. The Northeast is a great example. You know, one of the areas that really has been hit hard by the COVID crisis itself is New York City. Right. But it has driven out growth in terms of housing demand, both on the rental side and the for sale side, out in, into markets in New Jersey and Connecticut. Now, those are still higher cost, higher density markets than a fair amount of the country. Uh, in some of those markets, they are higher tax areas, but they're benefiting from the fact that you have people saying, hey, you, know, you know, rather than living in downtown New York, I, I want to take advantage of a single-family home in central New Jersey. And so that has benefited building. But as you said, nationwide, there's, there's some different stories. A lot of it is being driven by the underlying population trends that you have population growth in Florida. In Texas, where you have the, the two largest home building markets in Houston and, and Dallas, and then the mountain states. And the mountain states have been benefiting from the fact that they are lower cost areas, uh, more attractive to younger households than the more expensive and harder to get into markets in California, Oregon, and Washington. There's one other factor I'd like to bring up here. This build to rent. I mean, that's a factor, right? Because a minute ago we were talking about household formations, but when when you're talking about these publicly traded companies that are building homes to rent them, that's uh, sucking up some of the demand, isn't it? It is. And, you know, I think we can think of that as another form of demand for single-family homes. Yeah. Because not everyone who wants a single-family home, they, they want the front door, they want the lot, they want the, the additional space and the additional bedrooms. But not everyone who wants that can, can afford it, and particularly the down payment requirement to purchase a home can be a challenge, particularly for younger home buyers who might have student loans or other kinds of financial situations. So, yes, there is a place within the home building market for the, the built-for-rent segment. It tends to be small. Our estimates indicate that if you look at overall single-family starts, it's about 4.5%. The single-family starts are, are built for rent, meaning the builder or the developer holds that home and you know operates it as a rental property in the same way that a, a multifamily developer uh, would operate. But we think there's probably another 2% of single-family starts that are built and then sold to an investor, such as a REIT, for rental purposes. And, and all told, that would be about uh, 64,000 homes built for rent. And I do think, uh, you know, kind of based on your question, I think in 2021 and 2022, we're going to see that 64,000 number likely grow. And it could grow up to 80 or 90,000 easily just based on the modeling we're doing. Yeah, okay. 
All right, so just in summary and closures, the pace we're seeing now you can, you think will continue through 21? I do. I think we've got a fairly decent runway for additional growth, yeah. albeit at cooler growth rates than what we saw in 2020, so no, no 12% gain for single-family construction this year. Yeah. And then the real long-run issue, if you're thinking about the future of the housing market, is watch that 10-year Treasury rate. Uh, we have seen it increase over the last couple of months. It's now between 1.6 and, and 1.7%. And my guess would be that uh, as we see, see it get closer to 2%, that would tend to drive mortgage interest rates closer to 4%. Yeah. And it's that 4% 30-year fixed rate mortgage where you could see some housing demand pull back, particularly if buyers are having to pay more uh, for the cost of a home due to higher material costs. And if we slow down in the pace that we're building it, hopefully the expense of what it costs to build it will go down as well, right, because of the demand? That's right. I think over the next five years, we're, we're trying to find what those sustainable uh, patterns and costs of development are as we recover uh, from the really unusual events of 2020. Because the median price now is about 350000 isn't it? That's correct. All right, Robert, thanks so much for spending time with us. Again, been talking to Robert Dietz, the chief economist with the NAHB, and you listen to Kemp R and FloridaLA.net.